thank you. I'm actually just east of the Grand Canyon where the soil, for as far as I can see, is the deepest dark red clay color. And I can just see the eastern rim of toward the Grand Canyon area. And it's so beautiful. Oh, oh And I'm really glad that you can make it though because it was really in response to your experience on our monthly project in Colorado. I finally had this conversation and there was another partner that day as well. And it, it's, it, it has to do with a way that I feel like I understand our state in humanity. But um, I hope if I share that point of view that it will help others enact more compassion for one another through that understanding. And as I recall, your expression really was right around that point of frustration that we all, I think, feel at some level or another, which is, you know, what's with all these people not wearing masks? What's with all these people telling me I need to wear a mask? What's with all these? people that don't want to get a vaccine? What's with all these people trying to force a vaccine on me? What's with all these people X, Y, or Z that there's just this fractioning that leaves us without a coherent path forward in particularly vulnerable context. And, and why is that? And what do we do about it? Both when we're talking to our neighbor who doesn't want to wear a mask or we're thinking about how to make an adjustment to the healthcare system so that people aren't getting sick and dying when they don't need to be. And, um, and the, the, the reason that I think I have a view on this that's useful has to do with my study and interest in evolutionary dynamics and human development. Just kind of stopping right there at that full sentence. Jan, is there anything more that you would like to say about kind of what was working you then or where you would like to see this conversation go? And then anyone else that has a sense of any of that? Okay. I don't think so right now. Um, I have sensed, for whatever it's worth, felt a little lessening in my distress around that um but i do think it's worth mentioning that um in my estimation the only able to be relieved of some of that distress is into um really Buddhist compassion practice So Dion, you of course had perfect audio clarity for the last five minutes and now just when you spoke, broke up. And I heard you say that <laughs> the tension for you has lessened in that particular area. And for you, the sense of that has to do with the Buddhist compassion practice that's close to you. Am I in the ballpark? Yes, yes. And um, really a spirituality that I'm not, you know, still, don't know exactly what I mean with that, how I would define it, but it has to do with a sense of um, trust and surrender into all that is happening, whether, whatever the nature of it. Um, so often distress for me comes from resisting or being strongly opposed to something that is happening and feeling like it shouldn't be happening. And and so I have to let go of that. If it's happening, it's, it's happening. <laughs> and my resistance is too late. Uh, it doesn't mean I can't do everything possible within my power to improve a situation, but the sort of active defiance of something that's already in process 
or even in the past is definitely futile. Okay, give me the skillful means, or yes, thank you, right on. And Janice, you had a lot of enthusiasm around this call. Would you like to share anything that is landing for you and what? Well, I think one of the things that, um, I'm sorry I didn't shut the door, Dennis, um, that, that really resonated for me was that question that you first um, posed in your, oops, now I can't get it up, hang on. Uh, yes. That you first posed that very first statement about, um, uh, about why do people act in ways that are in complete opposite to what's in their best interest? And I know that's a real loaded question um, because who am I to say what's best for someone else? On the other hand, I it, it re what really resonates with me is the thought that um, that there's only so much I can control. I can control me. I can pretend to have control over my household. And that's about where it ends. Um, I, uh, I, I have done a lot of reading. I have to say, I've done a lot of reading, but I have had just this ongoing problem of trying to log into that uh, podcast that you had posted. I'll send it again. Dennis and I were speaking about that. And, um, and I was very interested. And I think what has helped me some, I mean, there's still this vast of, my brain is exploding um, for people I know and family members who are circling the toilet on, on self-care and self-awareness. And um, that upsets me quite a bit. There is a lizard crawling up my curtains. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I guess I've got real squirrel brain right now. Um, uh, I, um, I, I, what help has helped me is maybe not the spiritual aspect of the questions and mulling these topics over is that I go more practical, my brain does, and more clinical. And having, reading that article that I sent to you um, about denial, why it's so powerful, why it, it helped me to understand theoretically why these things happen, why people behave against what is clearly their best interests as far as maintaining their lives or their health. Um, and it, it helped me clinically. It doesn't help the spiritual aspect of, of, of bringing those things together and and making the clinical understanding mesh with what i know is scientifically but yet in my heart the best thing for all of us and and that in these times and all these uncertain times that I still need to find that place where those things work together, not in opposition to each other. That's a baby lizard, sorry. 
Okay. <laughs> I, I, I think, I, I hope that we'll touch into that because Janice, what I hear you echoing there is what um, uh, Dion brought up in terms of the Buddhist sensibility is that there's, there's a wisdom that allows us to see what we cannot change and things as they are. But then there's also the skillful means, which when we pause well enough, which might be long enough or still enough or some other adjective, but when we pause- I well, like that description, when we approach it well enough. And I, I'm struggling with that well enough. And that's just to say when we, when we find within ourselves the disposition that makes us as vulnerable as possible to the wisdom of action, then we can begin to prototype a skillful means with our families, our neighbors, ourselves, the system, what, what have you. And, and, and that's what I hope this conversation is, is contributes to kind of in a larger social sense is that some piece of movement towards that greater compassion and skillfulness. Compassion meaning to suffer together and then when I can stand with you and suffer with you, then, then doing something about my suffering is doing something about your suffering. There is no difference then at that point. And so it's a, I, hope, I hope what we'll find is some clues to an empowering perspective. So thank you for that, yeah. Dennis or Patience, do you have any thoughts or things you'd like to add right now? Right off the bat, I, I wanna say, um, it's such a complex topic. You know, there's so many moving parts, as, as many as there are human beings. Um, so really, the only thing I can really have any skill with is why do I act counter to my own interests? Why do I, you know, do these things? And if my initial reaction is I don't do that, is to just like pause and, and look deeper. Is that true? Do I really not do that? Am I just in denial? Like, you know, just to, to really be in the inquiry of um, how am I behaving and why? And, and to just continue to go beyond the surface obvious response. That echoes, I'll just mention, that echoes, you know, Dion brought up uh, Byron Katie recently. That, that, am I really doing this? Am I not? How am I not? I think there's better telling of her questions, but Byron Katie asked it, that which you asked that are very well as well. Thank you, Dennis. You're on mute. <laughs> I've been making some notes. Um, at the beginning, you talked about evolutionary dynamics. And at the moment, it feels that we're in the position of revolutionary dynamics because there's this sense in our country that uh, it's time to fly or die. I don't know. There's lots of ways to describe it. It reminds me in some ways of the, the feelings of the 60s and 70s when it was so much more violent, so much more immediate, so much more pain, and yet there wasn't a pandemic. And uh, just working off my notes here, the thought is to work for the best and prepare for the worst. That's uh, because in, in so many ways there's a defining moment coming, and that's the election. And uh, I can't recall an election in a long time where this defining moment is more urgent and clear. Um, I also know that what I've learned in working with you and PHE is that 
there's an opportunity to lean on the long lever at the right moment. And we're preparing for that right moment. It doesn't take many people on the end of a long lever to make a big move. Um, so the, when we're like this, when we're thinking like this, when we're projecting like this, that's preparation for the right moment. Although, obviously, we need to act. But what you just said, uh, patience, um, why do I act counter to my own instincts and beliefs? <laughs> that's just mind-blowingly powerful because I do that all the time. I just, I know it at least, but maybe there's sometimes I don't know it. And that's, uh, I keep coming back to the, the extreme power of what it takes to build habit and have a habit and a practice that's regular and routine. And there you are building a habit again. <laughs> that can be a habit for good, but if something comes along to shake your habit and the denial can be a habit, you have an extreme reaction. Um, someone described denial to me once as, uh, imagine that you've been uh, going to a Coke machine and popping in your money and getting your Coke. You're always getting the same reaction, right? And then somebody shakes your denial. You put your dime in the, in the quarter or whatever it is in the Coke machine and it doesn't come out. What do you do? You shake the machine, you kick it, you immediately react with this anger because it's not working the way it's supposed to, because that's what you're used to. That's what your habit is. And I think many people, how many will determine the election, right? How many people feel this way? How many people are so afraid that they've built up false world from our perspective uh, of denial that mirrors a reality where they feel safe? I think I heard on NPR this morning that, uh, Republicans, when questioned, is there anything Donald Trump could do that would keep you from voting for him? Clearly and with an open heart say, absolutely not. Doesn't matter. And that's a mindset. The question is, for how many? And can that many hold on to the levers of power for another four years and continue their crushes? And if it does, that goes back to I'll work for the best and prepare for the worst. <laughs> so, I wonder if they turned that same question on Democrats for Biden. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can see that. Um, My guess is we'd get a similar answer. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a whole lot of folks that are at the point where they'll say, "Well, I'll vote for anybody but Trump," and uh, we wonder how what that is, and then where where it is in between. And, as Jan knows, I, I dislike even speaking that name or addressing the issue to the point where it was beating me up and I sort of climbed off of that one. But um, this next couple of months, if in this next couple of months we can do what you have done in the last year, is that what you're saying? I know you don't think back to last December at all. It's gone. But if you think about your transformation over the last nine months, and uh, what a magnificent model that is of uh, pure intent in the uh, face of enormous setbacks. Um, it's a good model. You know? One of the best things for me was when I came to visit you and you admitted that there's just times when I said, well, fuck it, I just want to die. I don't want to stand this anymore. The human response to all this, and then there you are. And you were, to uh, quote, uh, what was it, Billy Crystal? You look marvelous. <laughs> you know, you really do. You're shining, man. So um, it is a model for how to handle the pressure. And uh, even the pressure of losing this election by whatever foul means it might happen. Uh, we can live with it. And it's a crucible. And, uh, you know, the more pressure, the uh, more the embers will glow, glow. <laughs> just give us some oxygen, man. <laughs> I'll turn off the faucet here for a minute and let somebody else talk. Dennis, you bring us in really close. And I want to use that as springboard to take us back very far. Um, it 
going to use a fictitious band of humans and call them, you know, they call themselves the people by the river. And they lived and they gathered their sustenance in that region near the bend in the river. And in that community, everyone was unique, but the diversity within the community was a pretty narrow band in terms of what gods were worshipped and what foods were ate and how one went about one's daily life. And then later in our journey, that band became in closer relationship to others and you got something like the Navajo Nation, right? Where there's a much greater number of individuals now that make up this community and their diversity is, you know, still each unique, but also very similar, but wider. Different foods were at in different parts of the wider community. And then you've got something like Rome, where the quote community had an even larger reach and a larger diversity within it. And yet there was also this coherent sense of what do we and who are we as Romans? What do we do? And then you've got something like America. And that is, again, a wider set of diversity still in the unique individuals in that community. And yet striving for some binding ideology of what do we do as Americans? Who are we as Americans? And you know, we're so clearly unsettled in that today. And yet we're now at the widest diversity that we've had on this planet, which is who are we as the human family on planet Earth? And in that we have the widest possible set of diversity in food choices and in religious beliefs and God's worships and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things that matter to a human being in their life day to day. And so we're still trying to find unity in that exploding diversity. And the people by the bend in the river, the worldviews in those people were largely divided along age lines that was fairly strictly limited to literal volume of experience that you had in your body. Children were children and elders were elders. Developmentally, there was not a vast range. Generally, most of the elders were familiar with the same stories and the same journey and the same set of experiences and shared a common set of meaning making around those things. And the children had a, a lesser set and shared some experience and meaning making around that. And along that spectrum between, there was a fairly consistent coherence. If you contrast that to the human species today, we have at one end of our developmental elder spectrum, Donald Trump, someone who has never ever learned to share a mutuality of concern with another. And then somehow by some strange magic, that same species produces Gandhi or Sri Aurobindo, who doesn't flinch to see their mutuality with the 
stardust of the farthest reaches of time, let alone the person standing in front of them. And so we really are, in my guess, on this planet, the widest range of ideological or identify identity-based distance of any species that's come here. And like, we'll just leave off the table for today the recent plague of New York Times articles and Pentagon releases and, you know, that we're probably not the only coherent, dialogic, technologically empowered species in the neighborhood. And how close we are to meeting that conversation in more material terms remains to be seen. But then the idea that we could all gather berries for the winter, like the people by the bend in the river, or agree on how to store or distribute those supplies in the winter is, is far-fetched. So just the foundation for me is just who's in the room, which is we think of ourselves as a people, as Americans or as human beings, or even as progressives or conservatives, or as Catholics or as Muslims or as Buddhists, but we are so much wider than all of that. In any one of those names, you can take the people who will kill each other about that idea and the people who use that idea to bind themselves to everyone else. You know, two or three days ago, the news was the far left and the far right in Portland were beating each other in the streets with sticks and the police were leaving it alone because they said, it seemed like everybody involved wanted to be there. And so then you take into that timeline, the structures built by the bands of individuals within each of these nested progressive human sociological complexes. By the river, everybody pretty much built the same thing. In the Navajo Nation, there were a handful of different kinds of organizational and life structures that people would collaborate to build. In Rome, again, that number multiplies. Again, in America, that number multiplies. Again, in the world, that number has multiplied. And all of these collective structures that we build in the communities that we cohere around us with those who are close enough to us, developmentally and ideologically, those structures impact the larger collective they off-put carbon emissions, or they begin to polarize political parties, or they begin to commodify work or resources. And those systemic aspects push back on the ideologies of the individuals. At the river, it's kind of a closed loop. We make a system, it pushes back on us, we adapt and change, the, we change the system, it's, kind of this nice dance, but when there's 10 groups making 10 different structure sets, but those structure sets don't just push back on the group that made them, but everybody else as well, you get this chaotic complex of developmental and evolutionary pressures that are increasingly divorced from my sense of having invented it or my sense of having some way to impact it. 
Dennis, you mentioned earlier, you know, if you can't change the place you work, change the place you work. So that seems a bit apropos for this conversation. Like, I'm still getting to why I think that results in people working counter to their interests or um, behaving counter to what seems obvious. And that is that as we have built this kind of Frankenstein systemic expression of the human species, the values that go into promoting a thing become polluted in a sense. You have the pure intent of the system initiators, but then you have all of the pressures of all the systems that they didn't invent or don't have a say in. You have all the pressures of the other people that their creation impacts or comes in contact with, and it feeds into this loop that becomes increasingly clouded for its design principles and intent. And you produce a system where, as Otto Scharmer says, we are all collectively energizing and producing results that no one wants. And so in that, we've created a couple of things. We've created a mainstream science, which doesn't omit, doesn't admit things that are uncomfortable to it or counter to its own habits, regardless of how self-destructive those habits might be. We've created information distribution systems like the media that are not pure information distribution systems, but are actually commodities for profit leverage for other power that is felt as important by people who find agency in those contexts. And this cycle of striving for power and particularly reducing that power to a monolithic construct called finance, where somebody sells, gets the patent for uh, EpiPens and raises the, pipe, the price 6,000% and then goes on the news and says, because I can, because that's my right, because that's my access to power in this world of clouded and confused systems that don't behave the way that anybody intended them. And the only way I can survive that machine is by insulating myself with enough of the gasoline that it runs on that I can direct my own little fiefdom of systemic function. And that pollutes everything. You do, there's, you know, Lawrence Lessig wrote a book a decade or so ago called Republic Lost, The Corrupting Influence of Money in the US Political System. And one of the chapters in there used the foil of is cell phone radiation bad for your brain? Well, it looks like the studies on that, at least as reported in that chapter at that time, were about 50-50. Some say yes, some say no. However, if you parse those studies by who paid for them and who has a vested interest in the outcome of those studies, the numbers start to slide dramatically over to the side of like, oh, if somebody who benefited from this study saying no problem, 95% of the studies say no problem, or 5% of the studies say no problem. And if there's no benefit to be gained, it's just a neutral question of, is this impacting my health in a negative way? 95% of them say cell phones are bad for us. But if there's 100 studies on cell phone radiation to the brain, and I'm Motorola, 
it's very little effort for me to commission a thousand more studies and submit for publication those 50 that say no problem. And now the body of accepted modern science says 75% of studies say no problem. That's reality. Get with the progressive modern rational objective program people. 5G is fine. You people wearing tinfoil hats are threatening my profit margins. And so we break the integrity of even what can be known. And just because something is propagated as most rational, most sensible in the mainstream of news and media and education and accepted culture doesn't give it integrity. In fact, more and more it gives it some mechanism of control. The podcast I shared from Zach Stein and Daniel Thorsten the other day cites a statistic on Facebook that something like 50 plus percent of the conversations that people are having on Facebook, many of them arguments about views on vaccines or cell phone radiation or 5G or masks, our conversation is being had with bots. Bots programmed with an agenda to manipulate view and dialogue. And so the things that seem obvious to us, like Joe Biden ought to be the president of the United States or everybody ought to wear a mask, are all tainted with an imperfect social coherence system, an information distribution system, decision-making systems, all of these things inherently polarizing because my, profit, my product needs to stand out in the sea of products in order to make an in, an, a difference. I can't just sell these artisan olives because if I do that, Walmart is going to notice I'm making a profit. They're going to pervert somehow the product in a way that allows them to dramatically undercut my artisan olives. And I'm going to go from a healthy family business to struggling to get by. So there's just so many complex pressures in our world today that we really can't judge one another for not, quote, getting with the program. Because every one of us is with some version of the program based on tragically imperfect data that is the artifact of how we have continued to build our increasingly complex and far-reaching collective structures and collective identities. And so there really is nobody making that vote against their own interest. And yet we are all in some way every day building effort and, and initiative against our own interest. And there's certainly a spectrum in that. There's, you know, I can vote people into office whose sole purpose is to take away all of the existing social safety structures that I rely on or devalue my land or devalue my savings account or any number of things. And there are subtler ways where I can polarize my friend in dialogue and decrease my ability to create a harmony that's going to build the love and the good will and the trust that I need in my community of relationships. 
So that's kind of the, that's my entree. That's, that's what I felt like I had to say when I heard what's with all of these people and going out without a mask. You know, vaccines were once filled with a preservative that may or may not have caused autism, but certainly wasn't good for the human bioorganism. Much of that preservative has been removed, but what's there now? Very, very, very few people are incentivized or resourced to tell me that that's a safe thing. I mean, to some clinical degree, it will build an immunity to X, Y, or Z, but what else does it do? I might not be getting told that. If we use the cell phone example, the wireless example, let's just say that the 95% of the wireless broadcast frequencies we're using in our cell phone towers is actually producing Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or stupid children or greater obesity or greater opioid addiction or something, how, somehow contributing something massive. Like what happens tomorrow if we just decided to turn off that whole network? What else gets destroyed? So there's, there aren't direct lines from what's good for our health to what's good for our health. And so everybody, Don, jump in. Oh, I, do, I, um, I don't, were you finished? I didn't, I don't want to cut you off. Oh, I'm, I'm there. You are there. Yes, please. Well, I just, you know, I, I appreciate all of that. I mean, I, I agree on so many points. Um, as a follow-up, I'll share with all of you, if you're not yet familiar. I believe it's the work of Jonathan Tate. Um, may be mixed with another um, who is actually credited for this. But there is some wonderful work on, quote, the morality of policy, meaning you can characterize people's political affiliation on five different measures. So you can predict it. And this sort of sense of a collective is definitely lean more one way than another. So uh, when you asked earlier about you know how many conservatives are are feeling similarly around now I can't remember the exact point but basically here's to be less value placed on quote compassion related practices or ways of being in the studies that have been done around this. So your thoughts on this um, in itself was not measure in these studies, but you know, I think you can extrapolate measures for it could be six, not that but but included in the classes, graduate classes I taught with another neuroscientist around cognitive bias. Well it's worth playing field in terms of um, who is who has a I would argue that everybody has the capacity compassion but not uh, because um, there are people who are more drawn to practices that will cultivate that or ways of thinking that will are more open or aligned with with that than than others. So I don't know how to <laughs> deal with that or interpret it or extrapolate from there, but um, I do think it's worth probing that more. And I also, the second thing I just wanted to add that I think complicates things is it's related to how you, or you, where you ended up around, you know, let's just be realistic when we ask 
ourselves, why are others not, not doing this thing that seems, quote, so obvious to me from where I stand, also acknowledging that I do things that seem completely irrational to others for whatever reason. But my angst for that day um, was really from the physician perspective. And the, there's a, a particular um, weight that comes with these COVID-related issues where, you know, it's falling on physicians and their care providers and even the system as a whole to, quote, deal with the problem in the sense that no matter how belligerent or badly someone's behaving in society, they, they get to go to the healthcare system in their time of need. And that's what we sign up for as physicians and other providers. And so we recognize that and we make the commitment to not make those judgments when we care for people. And um, I just wonder how do we address an issue like say mask wearing that endangers the people whose commitment to society well surpasses those who are so I'd love your thoughts all of you about any of that John you, you, you thank you for all of that and you broke up a fair amount but let me repeat back to you I'm imagining uh, what's coming through there, and then you can kind of maybe stop me if I if I get it too far afield. Um, where I kind of left the conversation had a lot to do with um, the kind of ambiguity of meaning and knowledge, and um, and I think that you brought us right back to the um, to the fact that there is good work going on uh, in terms of assessing the integrity of, uh, of, of a given worldview or a, of a knowledge set. Um, and that that's important to, to honor and recognize and to continue to, to build into. Um, and I think that you spoke to the kind of the, the impact of carelessness or of systemic carelessness and particularly expressed by certain portions of our community um, and the impact that that carelessness has on the important um, elements of our community that are designed and, 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 and volunteered in place to meet these particular challenges, in particular with COVID and, um, and our healthcare workers. Um, and then the last piece, somebody else helped me fill in the last piece of Dion's question, which was what to do about this kind of disconnect between someone's behavioral compliance that threatens the integrity of the work of the people that are working so hard and at such risk to be of service in this context? Does it feel like I, anybody else fit, fill in if I, I feel like I missed something that Dion was saying or Dion, if you can hear and speak back to that, I'd appreciate it. Hi. I think it was great. Janice or Dennis or patients, and you guys feel like I missed anything there? I, I think I, that's what I got from what Dion was saying. It it did resonate um, deeply uh, regarding healthcare workers and their committed. Um, their commitment to excellence and equanimity in service to those who have fallen ill with whatever, but um, it it I I think for I know for myself that the quandary comes 
when services are rendered to persons with, we'll take our current pandemic um, with COVID and some of those persons to whatever extent their medical needs are, um, if they've been infected, are being treated equally with those persons who have chosen to not protect themselves in every way possible. And there are people within these medical systems or, or, or persons who become sick and reach out to the medical systems who are being turned away for a huge number of reasons, many of which are because of the color of their skin and denied access to service when, when so many who are, have chosen not to do everything to protect themselves are, are using the very systems to the full extent that are being denied to so many in the population. That is, and I'm not, I, I am not at all proposing that if you chose not to wear a mask, then you don't get services. That, that's not at all it. I'm trying, to, I, I'm trying to justify for myself where that line is, why there has to be a line, why that it just more than grates against everything I believe in. And I, you know, that's the part that um, <clears throat> I have, I have trouble bridging that gap. It, it, yeah. I hear you, yes. Dennis, did you have something to add there? Sure. Um, I'm not even sure if I'm live. Can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Okay. Um, lots of talk these days about rights. And I think physicians have a right to protect, protect their lives. That's a fundamental human right. And, and of course, we've got Alexa back there telling us what rights are. Oh, Alexa, dear. Stop. <laughs> Sorry. Tell her she can get all this from the Chinese Central Party. They're, we're using Zoom. She can catch up on the conversation later. I just think somebody, uh, <clears throat> you know, tracked it and the AI put that in, the, in my ear here. But uh, there is a fundamental right to, to life. And that's what it's coming down to. If your behavior threatens another person's life, you're in the wrong. If your behavior of driving drunk on the freeway threatens the lives of innocents, you're in the wrong. And if we are part of a society organized around rules affected by many variables, but still basic rules, then people who refuse to protect themselves and others lose certain rights and in my mind it would be you do not enter this unless you obey the rules you want to come into an emergency situation we put a mask on you if you won't do it yourself we have to protect ourselves and that kind of coherent application of the basic right to life seems not a big reach and unfortunately it is that we see our neighbors screaming at each other over whether they have a mask on or not, right? That's a different level. But from a physician, first responder, direct contact person, they definitely have a right to enforce that. How they enforce it, of course, might end up compromising their ability to practice at all. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steer away just a little bit um, simply because I don't know. My operating assumption is here in San Diego, if you go into the hospital, you're going to have a mask on. And the 
physicians and healthcare personnel that address you are gonna be at least that protected from your potential source of contagion. Um, but that doesn't speak to like, why did I get contagious in the first place? Because I was running around the ballpark with all my best buddies and not wearing masks. Um, and and, and should, should I then get in line to clog up the, the healthcare systems in front of the people with dark skin that, you know, are working three jobs and trying to feed three kids and don't have access to information and are just doing their best and wearing a mask because they heard it's something they're supposed to do. And sometimes because it's a hassle and they don't always have them and God knows what else, you know. So, you know, there's a legitimacy within those structures, I think, to just drawing a line at the door. Answer these COVID questions, put on your mask and come on in. Um, but what to do about people that don't wear masks? So, I'm gonna speak of kind of a foil of a character of a couple of people that I know. We live in a world right now that already implicitly and effectively divides us against one another. Americans versus Chinese, left versus right, Russians and Americans, Muslims and Jews and Islam and Christianity and on and on and on. And that a mask is just one more straw on the back of an old camel that is really, really sick of being divided from one another. And I'm, I'm looking right now to be connected to my fellow human beings because I can see the world in decay around me, never mind COVID. And no thank you, I'm not going to cover my face and my smile from someone else if I don't have to. Right? And the degree to which I have to or when I have to, again, goes back to what is true. Where did this virus come from? And yes, there's tons of systemic and intentional misinformation in that field. And our Facebooks and our Fox News and our CNN all are compliant in creating those destructive confused narratives and information literacy is a luxury for those of us that have the time and the education and the resources to get exposed to that and that is by no means all of us and we don't know the story of our neighbor until we ask until we have the luxury of the time to stop and talk I'm thinking of the guy that came to cut my trees. A real died in the wall Trump supporter. Sure is the day is long that you cannot give a child to some same sex couple because they'll just, that's just not right. But when we sit down and we listen to each other for 10 minutes, opens up to the idea that, well, maybe there is something called masculine and feminine that aren't attached to gender. Right? Maybe there is something more going on that's worth considering. Maybe, maybe I can speak to this wingnut liberal, and maybe they don't knee-jerk disrespect my bath disbeliefs. So there's, there's just, I mean, it, it always comes back to this place of information and moral integrity that none of us has in any monopoly. And so not to do nothing and not to, to say we can't know something because I think to Dion's point, yeah, there's really great work emerging around how to investigate the integrity of a, of a data set or a meaning making system. And but what I think also comes about is
And Dennis, when you talk about who can't play if they don't follow a basic set of rules, it's just a hard line to draw. I mean, I was enthusiastically in favor of the candidate for the Democratic presidency in 2016 named Lawrence Lessig. Again, I'll reference that guy because his main proponent proposal was we need to get money out of politics because it's totally corrupting the whole system. And at the point that he earned the right to make that voice on the Democratic debate stage, the system that he was pointing to proved itself. And on Thursday, when he made the cut, changed its mind and said the cut needed to have been made two weeks ago last Monday and refused to admit to the public debate the real lived problem of money in politics in the United States and then claimed legitimacy and stuck Hillary up on a flagpole and said, we are the most legitimate political party and movement in America no one with any integrity would dare vote for Trump because we have the market on integrity corner. And I and others just laughed at them and their childishness and their ego and their arrogance and watched them lose to Trump. And watched so many of my progressive brothers and sisters turn their back on me because I wasn't willing to play the, the fight song go Hillary bastion of integrity. So there's just, there's really, it's hard to draw these lines. Sure, would I rather have Hillary as president over Trump? I honestly don't know. Because Trump is an obvious corruption. The corruption that Hillary represents is much older and much more entrenched. Which is worse for the world or for me or for America? It's hard data to parse. Maybe as Dion, Dion suggested, not impossible to parse, but certainly a meticulous battle if you're going to do it. And so what can I do when met with the neighbor or the non-compliant hospital visitor or the person who's just running around getting and spreading COVID because they're a super, super contagious because they're for whatever ignorance not taking seriously this disease, either because they, for obvious reasons, think it's a Russian plot or a Chinese plot or a pharmaceutical company plot, or you know, not that any one of those actors has given us any reason to trust them not to do something like that, right? Or any establishment of what is science has given us any reason not to, to doubt the integrity of their message. That, it, that actually, it brings us all the way back around to Dion's compassion practice. That I know I'm not gonna make peace, you know, and my reference to Gandhi, I know I'm not gonna make peace by making more war. I know I'm not gonna make peace by making more war in my heart or making more war against this person in front of me or making more war against this system which is so right or so wrong but i'm actually my only path forward is that of compassion where i have to like any parent knows i have to extend my kindness and my care and my skillfulness and my pace to encompass those around me who are less capable of defining those things and deciding those things. And where I meet resistance, I have to work slower than I want to. Because the point at which is my greatest capacity is the threshold between working slowly enough to bring everybody along or so quickly that I'm going to make war, right? That I'm just gonna 
smack the child, drag them into the car, whatever it is. And that's again, another gray area of, you know, spare the rod, spoil the child. Or smack the child, create a, a adverse childhood experience that means they're gonna be a heavier weight on society in 20 years or whatever. So there's the, there's the, the outward movement of making a declaration of truth or justice or the right way is slowed dramatically and only comes into legitimate play when I have practiced enough stillness and listening to be well in that. That naturally emergent from that in me, through me becomes the skillful means that moves what's in front of me today forward in a direction that's in alignment with all of the deepest of my integrity when I do what patience asked and really go slowly enough that I can see the weaknesses in my own integrity. And where I have truly strong integrity, I carry others with me. And where my integrity is fragile, I am more vulnerable to the pull and the direction of others in that movement. But that at the end of the day and in every moment it is how do I not surrender, as you recalled, Dennis, to just rolling over and dying in the face of this enormous oppression of difficulty and so much wrong? How do I resist that, but maintain my fidelity to love that does not condemn? And I hope that when we talk about the diversity of developmental perspective and meaning making and values within the human species, and indeed within every community we have, nearly without exception. And the fractured capacity for our structural systems to hold truth and integrity in goodness and beauty that we tread lightly on our own beliefs and our own condemnation of the beliefs of others even those that threaten to tear us apart and threaten to destroy everything that we hold valuable because donald trump for example arose in a context that was moving full steam ahead to create 100 million climate refugees as quickly as possible. And if you don't think that's gonna make the democratic elections of 2034 any harder, you're out of your mind. If there is such thing as democracy left by that. But the system that he broke wasn't exactly building Nirvana. In fact, it was very quickly building hell and maybe needed breaking. But it's hard to see from our habituated comfort, particularly those of us on the call, white, wealthy, middle-class Americans, who God bless us if we have had the good fortune to travel and see other conditions in the world. Hopefully, none of us have ever spent three to six months or six to 10 years in jail to see just how ugly else it can be. And so collectively, we are so much less than we imagine that we really are. And we need to come to grips with that if we're gonna meet ourselves and each other today in a way that addresses the terrible terrible conditions of so many frontline workers just trying to do their best to care for us and to get us through this 
enormous tragedy. But we also have to remember, while we're less collectively than we think we are, we are individually so much less than we can be. So we have a collective ego that we need to break and we have an individual integrity that we need to build. And I think that's true for every person that we meet every day. And that's, that's what I have to say about why people are behaving in ways that give us all so much anxiety and actually produce so much more death. Whether it's by continuing to drive cars that drive people into the ocean or not wear masks that drive people into the ER. And what we can do about it is meet ourselves with more integrity and look for where, where am I inciting division, even within myself or against my neighbor, even against that person that seems so far wrong that I can't get around behind them and see what brought them to that and then get around in front of myself and find out what am I do, doing that perpetuates that thing. And that's our 90 minutes and I'm happy to stay on longer if anybody else has any more they want to say about this or thoughts they want to investigate. But I feel like I've said kind of what I thought initially was worth offering to this conversation. As usual, I always come away from any conversations or meetings with you, Kabir, with a better center, um, a, a better ability, especially in the moment, but it carries through the ability to center myself as opposed to being pulled off in so many directions that are not helpful. And not only for me, but for my family. And bringing it back to self-examination is, is always the the important reminder and I thank patience for that reminder of what am I doing to create more anxiety as opposed to what can I do to bring more peace and calm and I say that within my family because that's what I got. That's my world. So, thank you. Thank you, Janice. And wearing thank a mask you. is such low impact. Low cost, low effort, could make such a difference. Exactly. Why I ask that's the, the question I repeatedly ask is why is that your line? Why is that the bridge too far? It's a mask. So the question then is how do we diffuse that question? Yes. How do we how do we ask you to wear a mask? but not make it about your values. Yes. And it, yeah. I want to add something really interesting about this mass conversation that keeps permeating through the deeper conversation that's being had here. <laughs> Cause I really get, it's so not about the mask wearing, but it's about like my individual 
um, ideas of what's right and wrong versus like what's actually happening out there and then how it impacts me when I see, you know, what's wrong for me being played out out there in a way that I would deem to be threatening. I digress. The mask thing. Um, and it's really interesting because what's coming up listening to the conversation about masks we're having right now is um, I am so very intimately acquainted with having panic attacks for no reason. You know, acute PTSD is probably one of the worst experiences I've ever had in my life where I couldn't drive down the street without having a panic attack. Now put a mask on my face and I'm just about jumping out of my skin, depending on the circumstances in which we're required to wear them, which is around a lot of people, which causes anxiety and panic in the first place. So living in a military town that San Diego is, and being around a lot of veterans, probably some of them with undiagnosed PTSD and visible injury, I can really get like, that's a real possibility for a lot of people around me. And knowing it as intimately and as painfully as I do, um, I can protect myself, you know, like I could not come within six feet of that person. I can make sure that, you know, there's distance or whatever that is, but it harkens back to, I have no idea who said this, but like each person is fighting an invisible battle that we know nothing about, you know? And even if I knew something about it, it likely wouldn't make sense to me anyway, because there's a whole history there from birth and beyond that informs those ways of being and acting. And, um, you know, I think that the times and the situation that we find ourselves in is just a really amazing device to practice like deep compassion and um, a deeper introspection. You know, I, I, I for sure get triggered by um, the, the opposite. You know, like when <laughs> I'm sitting in the grocery store parking lot finishing a phone call the other day and I park way out in the North 40 under a tree, get some, but nowhere near any other cars. And then somebody else parks way out in the North 40, a lane beyond me. And um, it's my understanding that if you're outside and not around a crowd of people and in the fresh air or in your own home, like the mask is just not ne needed, necessary, required, or even suggested. Um, but I see the person pull up in their car with the mask already on and walk, you know, a hundred yards from the parking lot to the store with the mask on. And I'm thinking, that's why, why are they doing that? And I find the question rolling around in my brain and it's like, do you're not paying attention to what's suggested or isn't that painful? Or are you just really full of fear? Like that's where my mind goes. And I want to be like, do you know, you don't have to wear this out here in the full sunshine with nobody around for another like 20 yards. But again, like, why does that bother me? Like, why is that any of my business? That person can wear the mask 24 seven. You know, if that's what makes them feel more comfortable, safe, secure, healthy, you know, what, whatever that provides for the other person is truly none of my business, but the brain is just going like it wants to find something to latch on to for, for me, like, so I feel smart. Like, do I know, I know something more than this person does or, you know, whatever, whatever there is there to divide and, and, and separate and feel um, superior to my ego wants to do at any given moment at the drop of a hat, whether I have, you know, some desire not to do that or not, doesn't matter. It's just kind of automatically running. And it's uh, my job as somebody who wishes to uh, be more in harmony with the humans that I cohabitate this planet with to check that tendency all the time. So uh, yeah, thanks for letting me share. I appreciate it. Appreciate the audience.
Dennis, you want to take us out? I'll, I'll start with thanking you, uh, Patience, for the empathy lesson. It's empathy is what uh, is necessary before we can act in compassion. It's a great way for you to ground us. And uh, thank everybody here for this time. What a great taste, um, a big slice of hmm, the road to being better us. So 